there was so much I still could have done. I had so much potential. There's so much I wanted to do. And yet, like most tragic stories, I'm going to be cut down for my prime before I even had a chance to make a difference. Adult Swim. Parents strongly caution, the following programs are intended for mature audiences over the age of 18. These programs may contain some material that many parents would not find suitable for children and may include intense violence, sexual situations, coarse language, and suggestive dialogue. Originally, I had a much bigger video planned for September, which as you should know by now is the month I always talk about Adult Swim. That's not to say that I won't also talk about Adult Swim outside of September, because I likely will, but the video turned out to be way too daunting, too difficult, and in the end, not even really worth it. And even if I postpone it to next year, I would still have to write more every day until that date, so... We'll see. Someone said I decided to pivot into writing a shorter video instead of that super long one, and by shorter video, I mean however long this video ends up being. Also, a small wrench was thrown into my plans when I was brought here, but we don't need to get into that. As long as I have my camera, I can entertain myself for at least a couple more years. Now, Adult Swim. We meet again. One thing I touched on in my original Adult Swim video for the anniversary is that Adult Swim shows don't last very long. I was upset at first when Three Busy Debras got canceled after season two because I wanted more, but then I remember call classics like Xavier, Renegade Angel, and Frisky Dingo also only ran for that amount of time. It's a common thing for Adult Swim. Sometimes. That's how they're able to create a constant influx of fresh and new ideas. Unfortunately, you can only have so many shows airing at one time. Especially when you only have a couple hours to air original content. I wrote this script um, a while ago, because I've been sitting on this topic for a while. So me saying, oh, Adult Swim only has so many hours in the night, and now it starts at 5 p.m. <laughs> but that's not a negative thing. I love Checkered Past. I love the idea. And we're stepping in the right direction. Last year, I complained about where Adult Swim was going and how the future is bleak. But Smiling Friends is fantastic. Royal Crackers makes me laugh more than I thought it would, and Unicorn Warriors Eternal. Uh, and I managed to watch both the Adult Swim April Fools broadcast this year and the first premiere of Checker Pass. Seeing all those bumpers, it was fun. And being in a call with all the swimmers and watching the April Fools broadcast was a whole lot of fun because Fire Ant started showing, and we were the only ones that knew, like, oh my god, this is insane, this is crazy. While people were complaining on Twitter that Pibby didn't show up. <laughs> Perfect example I totally forgot about, Tuca and Birdie technically also got cancelled after two Adult Swim seasons. And I know people are upset about that, and I am too, and I think they have a right to be upset. However, I think you just need to come to terms with the fact that sometimes that's how things are over in the pool. Either a show runs for two seasons, or it runs for double digits. There's no in-between. <laughs> Every Adult Swim fan has a story about their favorite getting shut down before it could hit its prime. Sure, Xavier and Frisky were firing on all cylinders right out the gate, but that is not a luxury most shows are given. Most new shows suck when they first start out and slowly improve over time. That's why I think the cancellation of a show like Inside Job is so devastating. I feel like it's been long enough now that I could talk about it without sounding like I'm dancing on its grave or whatever, but that show was not good. But it had the potential to be good. And maybe I'm just more mad about it because I keep getting videos on my TikTok feed now of like crazy conspiracy theorists saying they canceled the show because it was getting into government secrets. Most of the people I talked to about the show or I just heard talk about it said like, oh, the last couple episodes are really good. You just need to get through the rest. I'm sure season two would have been a marked improvement if it got one. And why a show like Close Enough never really found its footing. Like it was a good show, but it wasn't as good as it could be because despite getting multiple seasons, they only made like 24 episodes. I'm okay with shows getting canned early on. It's just the nature of animated television, but sometimes even I look at something and get sad. Yes, me, emotionally stunted Andrew Ultra. But I get sad about wasted potential, not mourning what a show was, but lamenting what it could be. And the only other thing that makes me feel like that is failed animated pilots. At the dawn of every TV show, only one episode is produced. That is called a pilot. How, How did, did you get, get to, to be, be such, such a, a good, good pilot? pilot? Adult Swim has many of these, and we're going to talk about them together, or at least as many as I feel are worth talking about. First of all, we gotta clear the air and figure this out. There are a couple of pilots or failed plans I knew about and knew I wanted to talk about before starting this, but I thought I should add some more. Adult Swim would occasionally air these specials. Some of them were movies and some of them were pilots. Like example, The Venture Bros started out as a specials short. I thought this would be actually really easy to decipher because on Adult Swim's website, they have a section titled specials. There are some that are clearly movies like Saddle Rash and Penguins Behind Bars, but then there are some that are 
not so clear. Like the Groovians, which is 30 minutes long and has a very succinct beginning, middle, and end to the story is listed on the wiki as a pilot. Also, it's technically a musical, which knowing me, I would talk about it for a very long time, except none of the songs are good. Groovinia. Groovinia. Groovinia is the place to be. Fun for you and fun for me. Groovinia is all I see. Money back guarantee. But then there's something like Let's Fish, which is a solid 11 minutes and sets up the premise, location, and multiple characters, but that's characterized as a one-time special. It's a little... racist? Question mark? I know in my heart that I'm not a- Lordy, Lordy, boss, here come the vittles. Get him while stays hot. Mm -mm. Whoa, dude. Oh, never mind. It's just the Cubans again. But it's got much more potential to be an Adult Swim show than the Groovians. I don't know why this was even shown specifically on Adult Swim. It has nothing adult in it. At the time, Samurai Jack and even like Dexter was more adult than this. So I watched every single one of these specials to determine which ones I actually thought were intended to be pilots. Because sometimes Adult Swim would just air really weird one-offs. And as a kid, it was super confusing to me. I don't know where they were coming from. But as an adult, I really like it. I like when they just air something that's not affiliated with anything else just as an experimentation. Like last year's Yule Log is categorized as a special and I know damn well that was not a pilot. Adult Swim has done a couple nights of pilots where they would show off multiple new shows like Perfect Hair Forever and Squidbillies and then more recently with Smiling Friends and YOLO Crystal Fantasy. One special I really want to talk about is Low Country. If you don't know, Low Country is just a live action 11 minute special that followed Space Ghost actor George Lowe around all day to show what he does when he's not acting. And many people believe this was intended to be a pilot. The wikis say it, I consulted with my fellow swimmers and they also said it, but I couldn't get to the bottom of why people think that or what information supports that. For one, it's a live action pilot that only came to surface in 2007, but it was filmed way before that. It never appeared on TV, by the way, at least to my knowledge. I mention this because they made Tim and Eric make Tom Goes to the Mayor be a pseudo drawn animation style because they were still part of the Cartoon Network. Adult Swim's first predominantly live action shows, Tim and Eric Awesome Show Great Job, and Saul of the Mole Men, both aired for the first time in 2007. Check out my fellow swimmers video on Saul of the Mole Men. Sorry all the swimmers I just lumped in and said, oh, I disagree with them. I love you guys. Later, an edited version of this pilot would air as a joke as a part of Adult Swim's 2011 April Fool's broadcast. Check out my fellow swimmers video on all the past Adult Swim April Fool's videos. Reparations. It was edited to star a CG space ghost in a sepia CG world. So it never aired on TV. It's pretty uneventful. It doesn't really set up the potential of multiple episodes. And it would have aired around the time Adult Swim wasn't even showing live action shows. So it's my belief that this was not ever intended to be a pilot. People just kind of run with that idea. And I'm fine with being proven wrong. I just... I haven't heard why. <laughs> because it doesn't feel like a pilot. It doesn't feel like anything, truthfully. It's a nice look behind the scenes, but it isn't spectacularly funny but maybe it wasn't trying to be. I get the feeling that maybe this was filmed as like a DVD extra, but never made it to one, so it was just posted on their website. And honestly, if I'm proven wrong, that's completely fine. I'm just going off all the information I could find, which is honestly not a lot. But if you could prove the contrary, please be my guest. I'm not gonna stand here and be like, no, I'm always right. I'd love to be wrong as long as it means we get more info. So going through all the specials and decrypting which ones are pilots and which ones aren't, I've narrowed it down to some pilots. I actually haven't landed on a number yet, so I shouldn't have said narrowed it down. And I'm leaving out all the 2023 specials that are labeled pilots because they aren't failed yet. Like, I don't want to hop on the train and be like, Lakewood Plaza Turbo is the best failed pilot. And then the show comes out 50 years later. Animation is a long process. Like, again, all the people that watched the Adults from April Fool's broadcast this year and got mad there was no Pibby. It's not just Pibby Day. Calm down. <laughs> What spurred on this section of the video is that I saw an old bumper from around approximately 2011 that talked about the most popular pilots and listed why they weren't made. The first pilot on this list is Duckworth of Ellington, so I decided to start with that pilot. Hey, wait a minute. Only then, while researching, did I find out that it was apparently lost media, but then upon watching the pilot on Adult Swim specials, did I find that... Uh, no, it isn't. Like, unless I'm missing something, this is the pilot completely intact. I was kind of hoping I could talk about another lost media mystery since people really like that, but unfortunately the archiving of media wins again. Dang it. It's Duckworth of Ellington, or just Duckworth, follows... Well, it follows a couple people. It's a mockumentary, or at least filmed like one, but halfway through the scenes stop making sense. Like, if the camera is a character, then who filmed in this old dude's house? But it jumps around a lot, mostly between Duckworth and Dirk. Who, by the way, is played by Matt Barry. Adult Swim could have jumped on the Matt Barry mockumentary hype train way before what we do in the shadows. Unless you count Dark Place, 
which you probably should. But either way, Adult Swim would have had a live action Matt Barry adjacent show. It's pretty funny. Despite having a great cast, the best part of the short is the editing. Eli Duckworth, dead at <clears throat> Ooh, look, look, Eli. Uh, turn around. See? 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 Turn around. Balloon! Yay! You love balloon. <laughs> Happy retirement! Congratulations! Because the old turning senile reporter of this town has his own way of reporting, which is funny. And then when they force him to retire, his replacement Turk also has his own reporting style, which is way more in your face, but also still really funny. The only thing is, the pilot ends with Turk on top, and then kind of sets up a rivalry between the two, but then in the credits, Duckworth is credited as a special guest. So I thought it was the perfect setup for a series, but now I don't know what the series could have been. At the very least, it would have been funny, and for me, that's all it takes. This village has seen some of the worst shelling in this conflict, even the orphanage. Okay, now let's play a game. Behind the seat, give me this. Give it to me. Let go of it. This pilot originally aired on January 18th, 2011, very late into the night. Well, technically early into the next morning. It aired as a part of DVR Theater. DVR Theater is what Adult Swim called its 4 a.m. to 4.15 a.m. slot on weekdays for a very long time. There was no real rhyme or reason to the stuff they would air. A lot of the time it would just default back to normal Adult Swim scheduling. The general idea is they would air old shows that haven't been seen on the network before, parodies of old shows, and sometimes new pilots disguised as lost tapes. Duckworth of Ellington aired as a part of DVR Theater that night, but it wasn't the only one. <laughs> Listen, I get the joke. The joke is that the title's long, but there's no way I'm saying this every time. I'm just gonna call it Cheyenne Cinnamon, and even then, I'm probably just gonna call it Cheyenne. This is a weird one, but not weird in a great way. I mean, it was made by Dave Willis and Matt... Harrington? That's not the right Dave and Matt. Are you cheating on Matt with another Matt? Anyway, it's not super funny, and if it was intended to be a pilot, it doesn't really work as one. And I mean, it doesn't set up much. It does have a purposefully unfulfilling ending but that's still an ending. That's not to say the pilots can't have an ending, but I just don't see where you could go from here. Like, where could you even go or what could you even do with these characters? And by characters, I mean character because our whole identity is a parody. And even then, Cheyenne, the person in the title and supposedly the one the show is supposed to be about, is not even the most famous member of this cast. First of all, the secondary main character is voiced by Kristen Shaw, which tells me that maybe she was supposed to be reoccurring because Kristen is great at her job. I'm saving my vagina for marriage, and you can too. But you're divorced. Hey, right? hey, oh, I got you. Yeah, don't worry about oh, that. Cheyenne, go talking about her private life. She cannot discuss oh. ongoing litigation as per terms of the settlement. She's in a good place now. Oh. She only has questions about her new album. Ooh, love you, baby hugs, and what about June 19th? Sorry. But upon seeing the opening credits, I learned that T Pain is somewhere in the show and. MF Doom? MF Doom, one of my favorite artists, could have potentially been a reoccurring member of the show, and to me that seems like the only reason I would want it to get greenlit. Maybe he would have only been in the pilot, and I think I'm starting to do that thing where after an artist is gone, you retroactively look at all their unproduced content, unmade projects, and long after them because you want more content and you're sad that they're gone. You guys ever thought that maybe Michael Jackson's unmade songs were unmade for a reason? It's like digging through the garbage of corpses. It's weird. I don't like the pilot that much, the music and the visual hurt me all all around my head area and it's kind of just feels like a middling aqua teen episode but i would gladly sit through all of that i'll just put on sunglasses and not look at the screen to hear christian shawl t-pain and doom all play off each other so yes at the time i do understand why they didn't go forward with this show the next night also a part of the dvr theater block we got two more potential pilots and they are pilots for sure <laughs> Totally Teens took me a little while to get into, but when I did, I really, really liked it. I liked most of it. I liked some of it. I originally liked the concept of another variety TV show parody, but this time it's one of those trying to be cool with teen shows and there's teens in the crowd. I thought that while the funny idea doesn't really seem like a format that could yield multiple different episodes. Like, of course, I'm judging these on their individual status, but also how they would work as a show if they were to get picked up. But they do cut to multiple reoccurring segments in the episode. One of them is supposed to be an episode from decades ago, and they actually replicate that style perfectly. Ow! The drugs, they hurt! Oh no! I'm afraid the drugs may have been bad drugs. But let's be smart. We can reverse bad drugs with good ones. How? how? I'll call Mookie. He's got good drugs. It's our only hope. I'll call him in this machine over here. Mm -hmm. 
Like, you could convince me they actually filmed this in the 70s. The show opens with a joke about Good Charlotte being the weekly musical guest. No matter what I do, all my videos are always connected by some kind of cosmic tissue. But then we get on the street interviews and segments, which seems similar to Eric Andre, but honestly, it has more wonder shows in, in it, if you know what I'm talking about. Can you justify capitalism in three lit words or less? Can I justify it? Wonder shows and wouldn't prank randos as much as they would kind of trick them into saying awful things and singling out weird people Borat style. Bah! What's the worst kind of trouble you could get into with a team? Hanging out with a team and doing the wrong sh Choices! That's right, choices. And the fact that this show is a parody of a live teen show and Wonder Shosen was a parody of a live kids show, I thought they had to be related. But to my knowledge, none of the staff of Wonder Shosen worked on this show, which they easily could have. I know Wonder Shosen was on MTV, but the Wonder Shosen team was already given a show by Adult Swim around this time in Xavier Renegade Angel. It's the same team. I just thought I should bring that up because at first it seems heavily based on Tim and Eric and similar to Eric Andre, mostly with its sporadic editing, which was my favorite part. The thing I didn't like, which is unfortunately a problem I have with wonder shows and sometimes is I get the joke it's kids and teens doing things that kids and teens shouldn't do but we have to remember that these are actual children there is a line I'm pretty sure that the audience in totally for teens are actual teens like I know they're actors but I'm pretty sure they're teen actors they look like teenagers but the joke that ends the episode is a bunch of teens biting the tops off of pickles and then the pickles shoot mysterious white cream all over the teenagers' faces, so much so that the adult sim was like, no, you have to censor that. Like, I get the joke. I, I get it. It's edgy. I understand. But it's real children. How about don't fucking do that? I feel like I'm not asking too much. You just, you shouldn't do that, man. This is something I've been noticing recently about myself, where as a kid, I never thought I'd be one of those adults that's like, oh, think of the children, don't let them watch this. I would probably see this as a kid and be like, oh, this is so fucked up, haha, <laughs> nothing's off limits, we're, we're the edgy guys. But seeing as an adult, it, it shoots into their fi like, come on, dude. I had a good feeling about this one up until the end, at which point I realized that there's some other jokes I really don't like that I looked over because I thought the good parts were good enough to overshadow it. I understand why Adult Swim didn't want to make this show. I'd burn the tape if it was handed to me. I can't afford another lawsuit. It's probably for the best that it never got made, but similar to what I said about the last special, it would have been cool to see what this cast could do. I imagine each episode would have been focused on a different teen, but Matt Bennett gets a whole storyline in this episode. Yes. That Matt Bennett? So, who's it gonna be, kid? Well, I just can't decide. But, future smoker me, when you touch me, I explode. I'm sorry, Jamie, but your time is up. I just can't choose. You knew the rules. I'll wait for you! Matt Bennett as in Robbie Shapiro from the hit Nickelodeon show, Victorious. I do my best not to declare an actor as one thing, like they're only known for this one thing, but he's still profiting off the Nickelodeon heritage. I can't imagine he cares. People keep asking me if I've seen the Nesda Classified podcast, and it's fun to watch sometimes where they're just reminiscing about the show, but it, it's so sad to watch them be like, oh, come on, let's bring the show, like, ah, uh, just, you gotta move on, man. I think it's kind of a plague on specifically most Nickelodeon stars where they're kind of cursed to keep going back to doing that thing and only known for that thing. Josh Peck was in Oppenheimer, one of the best movies of the year, and people are still like, oh, spherical. But I think he's a good fit for the show, sans all the weird kid stuff. Had enough of that over at Nickelodeon. Because it's an absurdist comedy parody show, which he is fantastic at. It's kind of a shame he doesn't get the recognition for being a weird fucker, which he is, and I love him for that. Most of the cast wrote their own songs for Victorious, but you would think like the sillier ones were made by the writers, but the Broken Glass song he sings, the really strange one, he wrote that song for the show, to perform it on the show. And while everyone's focused on Liz Gillies being a great actress, or Ariana Grande being musically talented, or Leon Thomas being a great producer, nobody listens to the weird guy stuff. I'm here for you, fellow weird fucker. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, you guys really biffed it at the end of this episode. It wouldn't have been perfect, but it would have been better.
This thing is insane. I'm gonna be honest, of all the potential pilots I knew I was gonna talk about, this one seemed the least interesting to me. The title and the thumbnail on the website just seemed like another generic animated pilot, or just an animated pilot, and it is, but it's also so much more. The pilot implements my two favorite things, mixed media and absurdism. Snake and Bacon are puppets. There are live action actors on drawn backgrounds, and the fully animated parts replicate their style so well. Get you gloved up. Can't have you contaminating the semen. All right, <clears throat> that's a blood puddle. That's a brain puddle. And that there is blood and brains. Sort of a twofer. There's a bit in this special that's like a parody of golden era superheroes and it's set up as a flashback. One thing you should know about the special is that it goes full throttle into its non sequiturs. Imagine if every time there was a cutaway gag in Family Guy, the episode then continued to follow that cutaway and then there's a cutaway in the cutaway and then the show follows the gag for the rest of the time. A better comparison would be the shivering truth, but evidently I'm the only one that watches that show. Anyway, the old superhero bit replicates the style of old action comics. And there, like an omen, what? A fruit bat! That's it! I shall dress as a piece of fruit, a different kind every month, and use a bat, or rather, a club, to strike pain into the heads of wrongdoers. And so I became... Fruit of the Month Club Man! I love when shows go in depth to replicate the style they parody. Like whenever Teen Titans Go tries to make fun of a different era, but you can clearly tell it's still animated in the TTG style. Why am I talking about Teen Titans Go in 2023? I was already on board with this one in the first couple minutes. First off, Christian Shawl is also in this pilot. It's kind of a shame they kept trying to get her in one of their shows, but it never really worked out. Real quick side tangent, there was an episode of Aqua Teen that featured religious fruit, and they were voiced by David Cross, H. John Benjamin, and Christian Shaw. And it was funny enough that the creators thought it would be a really good spinoff. And to their credit, the spinoff did get a whole four or five episodes. Oh. For one, the characters weren't taken directly from Aqua Teen. They were changed to sports equipment for some reason. Maybe it was to avoid the ire of VeggieTales, but that's clearly what they were satirizing. Anyway, the show didn't last that long, but technically they did get their Kristen Shawl show. Congrats, guys, you did it. And David Cross and H. John Benjamin continued to have a really good relationship with Adult Swim. Nothing bad happened to them at all. They're all still great friends. We'll get into it later. And on top of the first minute, the Snake and Bacon theme song goes hard. It's fantastic. Who's the team that you've seen on the stage and the screen? Who's the pair everywhere at each high class affair? I don't know what the show would have looked like had it gotten greenlit, but to me, that's much more exciting. The fact that the show could have gone anywhere and done anything, so much potential. I don't want anyone to think that this video is me complaining that Adult Swim didn't make any of these series. Despite what the video title may have told you to get you to click on this video, by the way, haha, got you. It's possible none of these shows would have worked out anyway. Obviously, it's just curiosity on what stuff we could have gotten. These aren't missed opportunities or failed pilots. They're just interesting to look at and talk about. Sorry to ruin the whole point of the video, like right out the gate. Sorry also that I didn't have much to say about the pilots other than it's good because it's good. Nothing. It's bad. Don't you see? It's bad. <laughs> Now, I've heard about this one so many times, and I'm sure you have too. Korgoth of Barbaria is a 2006 Adult Swim animated pilot created by co-writer of the Spongebob movie, Aaron Springer, and Genny Tartakovsky, creator of Things That Are Good. They both have very distinct styles of comedy that come through in even their most serious of projects. What I had always heard, and what Adult Swim said in a bump once, is that the show wasn't picked up because it was too expensive to produce. And it's interesting to see now, after Gendy has created Primal for Adult Swim, and then also Unicorn Warriors Eternal, which honestly looks way more expensive than Korgoth. I don't think it was a lie or cover-up. I'm sure they were telling the truth, but they were just telling the truth in 2006. Adult Swim was popular, but it wasn't throw money at it popular yet. It wasn't basically take over Cartoon Network popular. For all of Rick and Morty's faults, it did kind of put them on the map, at least for your average viewer. Like everyone loves the Eric Andre show, but what percentage of people who know him actually watch the show as it airs? Oh, what, you're staying up on Adult Swim at 4 a.m. like me? I don't think so. You're not in the trenches. The thing about Korgoth that I said a little bit ago is that it's really, really funny in a way that only a Gendy project can be funny. A new sign! What's the matter with the old one? He said they misspelled something on it. Mm. What they misspelled? Well, the name of the bar is the Dragon Kneecap. Damn it! 
that? You could tell this was boarded by a professional boarder because the visual gags in this special are as plentiful and funny as all the other jokes. Despite Adult Swim airing this pilot all the time, because it's a really good pilot and they own the rights to it, so you might as well. Phil's time, good content. I hadn't actually watched it the whole way through until I was writing this video. I expected it to be full of gore and action and like edgy funny because of that. But no, it's just a legitimately funny pilot. Who would have thunk it? Well, all right. <laughs> Come on, give me some Korgoth! But therein comes the hypothetical question we keep asking here. What if it was made into a series? First off, my favorite gags and lines in this special come from the company of goons Korgoth takes with him on his adventures. Korgoth does a lot of funny things, but he isn't really funny himself. He isn't pathetic, and he doesn't really crack jokes. And while I love these pilot, these characters have no real allegiance to Korgoth, and he leaves them at the end. Whatever future adventures or episodes this show would have would revolve around a revolving roster of different characters. That being said, I do think the humor would shine through anyway, the crux of this series is Korgoth traversing through the funny world around him for booze and money. I know we're dealing with hypotheticals here, and we can really just make up whatever we want, but let's be realistic for a second. The only way this show could have been made in a reasonable amount of time is if they severely slashed the budget. So the question is, would Korgoth still be a good show? Would it still even be Korgoth if it didn't look like this? Again, I was kind of surprised how much more I found the show funny than I thought it looked cool. I thought the main thing would just be the visuals of it, but it was legitimately good writing. Maybe you could make it work on a smaller budget and it would still be funny. I mean, Tom Kenny and John DiMaggio absolutely carried the pilot with their performances. They might actually, I know there's more voice actors, but I think like 90% of the show is just them. You will regret what you have done this day. I will make you regret ever being born. You're going to wish you never left your mother's womb where it was warm and safe and wet. I'm going to show you pain you never knew existed. You're going to see a whole new spectrum of pain, like a rainbow. You tell him, Scrotus. Ah! The writing could be funny with a slash budget, but the writing isn't the only funny part of Korgoth. Would we lose those funny visual gags? Would we lose the spirit of Korgoth? I think Adult Swim made the right decision here. Maybe I would have been more upset if the pilot dropped in like 2010. But ever since then, Gendy Tartakovsky has gone on to bring back Samurai Jack on Adult Swim, make the fantastic series that is Primal, and get a new show with Unicorn Warriors Eternal. It all worked out, and we could all still enjoy Korgoth as a cool little special. And you can watch it on their website, but I do hope they continue to air it from time to time just to get some new casual viewers a chance to experience the legend of Korgoth because before even seeking out this pilot or seeing people talk about it on the internet I just saw it randomly top up on TV sometimes an extension of what I said earlier about shows not having to run long to make an impact could also be said about these specials the fact that people still talk about Korgoth to this day is a pretty magical thing but I think we should switch up the language a little bit stop talking about the opportunity squandered with what Korgoth could be and start appreciating what Korgoth is why am I arguing with my own video press? Just call it something else. This is another one I've heard a lot about because it's old, but hadn't actually watched prior to this video. I heard it's a pilot about four nerd friends who all nerd out and go on nerd adventures. And a lot of the time, nerds on TV are just kind of off. Like, you can tell a nerd clearly didn't write them. That being said, the people that work on cartoons are nerds. I say this as someone who, like, you know... I'm, I'm proud. That's just the way it is. It's really funny whenever conservatives get mad and they're like, oh, the Disney channel, big Disney's trying to turn your kids gay. No, man, just a lot of gay people work on cartoons. This is just like Luke Skywalker. Everyone knows Luke Skywalker. That's not a nerd thing. So when they're referencing voice actors and old shows, as well as incorporating movie quotes into their dialogue, you know you're in good hands. You leave me no choice, Bill. I challenge you to a trivia off. <laughs> I felt a little offended when I realized I talk like the characters in this show. A big part of growing up, especially as a nerd, is realizing that nerds aren't really the victims they set themselves out to be. Like, yeah, a lot of people get made fun of just for liking obscure media that isn't popular, but then sometimes you hear other nerds say, oh, girls never go for a nice guy like me. And then you hear how they talk about women and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, you deserve it. And not all nerds are awful. I, I wanna make that clear. But Welcome to Eltingville is an accurate depiction of nerd culture, not just because of how the nerds talk, but also because of how awful the main cast is to everyone, including each other. Putting this pilot in my favorite genre of television, awful people being awful to each other, as awful things happen to them. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being antisocial. While I may seem confident 
and well-spoken as I speak into this microphone in my empty room talking to a camera. I'm the kind of guy that will go to a store with the intention of getting something specific but be so nervous and won't be able to ask for that thing because I don't want to burden the people working at the store. So I just, I just, I want to crumble and stop existing. But if you go to enough conventions or retro stores or frequent online discussion, you will find people exactly like that. I know that bad people being bad is kind of, let's say, an acquired taste. And by that, I mean... You don't have to like it, it's fine. It's not for everyone. It's because there are often shows that get the setup wrong and the bad people just kind of get off scot-free. I think it's not only important to have bad people lose regularly, but also to keep their stakes small and personal to them. The Ed Boys just want to buy Jawbreakers and when they aren't able to because their scheme fails, it only affects them. Meanwhile, in this pilot, the Nerd Squad is constantly fighting amongst themselves and the climax of the episode is two of them fighting over a mint condition Boba Fett and they accidentally destroy it by doing so. And we know because it's set up in this episode that they both really want the figure, no one else in the comic shop is competing for it. So when they break it and have to pay for it, it affects them the most. Care to concede? Concede this, you ECW! ECW! Plus, the only character who gets taken advantage of that isn't on the main team is this little guy with the briefcase, and he just loves unconditionally. Why can't somebody just put that little geek out of our misery? It's all right. Oh, I I'm okay. Hey. Oh my God. Come on, come on. Hurry. Oh. Got it. Got it. Got it. Oh. Got it. Oh, got it. And that's another good way to get around making bad people unlikable. Sure, he gets hurt, but he just wants to be a part of the gang, so he doesn't let what they do affect him. Honestly, the only negative things I have to say are just the lack of screen time and stakes for some characters, something that could have easily be remedied with just more episodes of the show. This would have been fantastic for the early lineup of Adult Swim and Meshed really well and would have been popular among nerds, maybe been a cult classic and maybe even have them do a little inner soul searching about themselves. But unfortunately, it's just a little bit ahead of its time. The reason all the previous pilots were lumped together in that one bump I keep referring to is that they all came out within a five year period. Welcome to Eltingville aired in March 2002, meaning Adult Swim had only been around for seven months. And at this point, Adult Swim was only airing on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, this is before Adult Swim expanded to every night and expanded to every day as well. I'm not complaining. I think it's really cool because I I stay up really late and then wake up really late. So it's cool that when I wake up, Adult Swim's on my TV, even if it is just Cartoon Network shows. So considering they weren't putting a whole lot of time and money into Adult Swim at this time, all of their shows were either acquired or special programming like Aqua Teen. And I love Aqua Teen. It's legitimately one of my favorite shows, but it isn't animated like Eltingville. It seems strange that the reason for Eltingville and Korgoth not getting picked up are the same, too expensive, when they look almost nothing alike. And Eltingville looks about the quality of a show that Adult Sim would air now. I've mentioned before that a lot of people would judge an animated show for looking ugly when in reality that was a graphical choice chosen by the art team to make it have a distinct style. But the ones I worry about is when a show looks bland. That's why I was so surprised and kind of excited that I really liked Royal Crackers because it looks like a show that would air on Comedy Central in like the middle of the day and get like 10 episodes. I I'm, a, I'm a crackerhead. No, I can't. There's we got to have a better name. Taint. It's just the nature of when the pilot dropped wrong time, wrong place. Well, right place, wrong time. They had to have aired this one again because I distinctly remember seeing it while watching Adult Swim as a kid and there's no way I watched it in 2002 when I was one. I had always heard Eltingville and Korgoth talked about the most and I always wondered why it was only those two. So I decided to watch a bunch of them and then I understood. They could have at least talked about Snake and Bacon. I really like Duckworth and Snake and Bacon, but it's very clear that these two are the best pilots of the bunch. But again, I come back to the thought, I'm not mad that these weren't made. I think that they would have been good shows, but that's okay. Because these pilots still exist. They exist under the categories of specials. You can watch them right now. I try not to send people off as much as like, oh, go watch the thing I just explained, because that potentially means I did a bad job of explaining it. Like, oh, it'll speak for itself. But legitimately, I think you should watch these. I do think these pilots stand out on the their own as half hour specials and you could just watch them on the website right now so i see no reason not to direct people to it i'm a shill hire me adults put the hire me bitches bump up pick your favorite that i've talked about that seems the most interesting and go for it if you're a real freak, you can watch Totally for Teens if you want. It sounds like I'm wrapping up this video, but I'm definitely not. It's gonna be shorter, but like we're still like halfway. I'm just one pilot away from being done with the specials section. It's gonna get a little confusing after that. Ah, yes, my favorite topic. Drama. Icelandic Ultra Blue is an absurdist parody infomercial that aired in the 4 a.m. slot under the name Paid Programming. And you may be thinking, Andrew, how could this be a failed pilot? Infomercials became a show on Adult Swim. And to that I say, 
Uh, but that wasn't part of the plan with Ultra Blue. First off, I really want to talk about infomercials because I think not enough people do. Sure, people talk about the spooky ones like too many cooks, unedited footage of a bear, and this house has people in it. That's fine. But those went viral without people knowing what they were or what they were a part of. Infomercials is an anthology comedy series, and even then, it's more of an umbrella term used to refer to the independent specials aired on Adult Zoom in the 4 a.m. time slot. But you can watch them all as episodes in the infomercial series on HBO Max. I'm not calling it Max. It's stupid and on Adult Swim's website. And this is, I'm not joking, one of my favorite shows of all time. If you want to take a peek into what I find funny, this is it. This is the pinnacle. This is the peak. It's a shame not enough people talk about the other episodes, but I still laugh every time I rewatch and still quote Broom Shakalaka to this day. It's one of my fa- I keep saying one of my- legitimately- People use the term peak fiction a lot. It's one of my favorite things in existence. And they even aired it again as a part of this year's jumbled assortment of April Fool's broadcast. I was ecstatic, but not everyone was as easy to please. I don't get it. Where's Pibby? I'm never gonna stop making fun of that. And upon watching it with some fellow swimmers, it was revealed to me that my favorite episode I just talked about, Broom Shakalaka, was actually directed by Daniel and Daniel. Also known as The Daniels, as known as the directors of uh, a little movie you may have heard of called Everything Everywhere All at Once. My favorite movie of last year. And listen, I saw Barbie, I saw Oppenheimer, I saw Talk to Me, I saw Infinity Pool. I'm gonna see a bunch of stuff. Listen, I... I'm not, I try not to be like generic film guy, you know, I don't just watch cape flicks. I try and see a movie every week to expand my palette and see everything I can, you know, I like variety. That being said, my favorite movies this year is either Spider-Verse or Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I'm not joking. I've been following these guys' careers for way longer than I thought, by complete coincidence. So when I heard that the first episode listed on HBO Max isn't actually the first Adult Swim infomercial to hit the air, I was intrigued. Also, sometimes you just get into something and become emotionally in invested, and regardless of quality, you want more of that content. Every time I finish rewatching Arrested Development, I consider watching seasons four and five, but then I'd come to my senses. Anyway, Icelandic Ultra Blue was the first ever Adult Swim infomercial to air in the 4 a.m. time slot under the name Paid Programming on November 3rd, 2009. And just like all the other infomercials, it's incredibly funny. It's kind of a, co not a cop-out, but whenever I'm talking about these pilots being like, oh, it's funny, you can't really explain that. You know, it, it just is. In the 36 years I've been hanging out in the medical community, community. I've never seen a product more effective at creating well-being. However, it's more similar to Tim and Eric as it jumps between multiple ads and mediums, but to be fair, infomercials had some of that too. There's not much I could say about Icelandic Ultra Blue other than it's funny. You know, I just said that, but I do have a lot to say about it. Then t come on down to Camel's Nazi Gold Exchange. We'll give you cash for your Nazi Gold. I got over $350 for my Nazi Gold. Now I can play golf one more time. It's just that, and I, again, I hate drama, but the things I have to say about it aren't really about the special itself, but it's important context. The pilot ends with the scientist in the ultra blue labs talking into his watch and saying, phase one is complete. A scientist goggles glow, and then we get a to be continued. Now, that is very unlike the other infomercials. Infomercials is an anthology series. Every short is set in their own independent universe. The episodes aren't connected, and they definitely don't tell an overarching story. And don't go in my comments and tell me about the interconnective universe of Boomy the Cat and Lyme disease. I Listen, I saw the theory videos. I was there too. I said Lyme disease. I meant to say Lynx disease, but I'm not going to change it because I think it's funny. The reason this seems different and aired years before the actual infomercial show is... Tension. Icelandic Ultra Blue was created by David Cross and H. John Benjamin from Soul Quest Overdrive, the show I talked about prior. Uh-oh. But they've been in a ton of Adult Swim projects. Lucy, Daughter of the Devil, Aqua Teen, Home Movies, Tim and Eric Awesome Show, Great Job, which is probably where they got their inspiration from. But strangely enough, aside from the acquired series like Bob's Burgers, which they don't own, H. John and David Cross haven't appeared on Adult Swim since Icelandic Ultra Blue aired. They do voices in it, but they were very interested in the idea of tricking unsuspecting late night viewers into thinking they were seeing an actual infomercial so they couldn't show their faces. Although it's very clear that from the jump, it was made for comedic purposes. Hey there, Mrs. K. Kimmel? How's the splinter? This is Kimmel? Honey? I'm sorry, Mr. Kimmel. Your wife didn't make it. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! This falling out is a story between David Cross, H. John Benjamin, and then Adult Swim president Mike Lazo. It all started with the Reddit AMA in 2015, where David Cross was quoted as saying, Fuck Mike Lazo. Is the A project you've worked on in the past you wished more people knew about? 
Uh, yeah, gosh, yes, Icelandic Ultra Blue. It was actually called Paid Programming. Adult Swim completely and totally ripped off the idea. We did it for Adult Swim. John Benjamin and I did it. It's really funny. And the idea that I pitched to Lazo in his office, standing in front of him back in 2008, I want to say, was to do a fake infomercial that would air at 4 in the morning, and it would be called Paid Programming so that the viewers wouldn't know it was fake. And it starts out very realistically, and it subtly devolves into this crazy nonsense. But it would really fuck with people's heads. Let me make it clear. I think the people who had the concepts for Too Many Cooks didn't rip us off. I think Adult Swim was the one who ripped off the idea. And I actually aired it once. It aired at exactly the time I pitched in that exact way. And they didn't pick up the show, which I guess makes us a couple years ahead of our time. So fuck Mike Lazo. He's a thief. But go to YouTube and see if you can check out either Icelandic Ultra Blue or Paid Programming or even Wikipedia It. Because it's really, really funny. I think you'll like it. The shorter version of that very long response is that David Cross believes Adult Swim, specifically Mike Lazo, ripped off John and his idea. Although their version was supposed to be ongoing, it was their idea allegedly to air a fake infomercial under the name Paid Programming in the 4am slot. And honestly, if it ended here and this is all the info we had, I would just equate it to sour grapes in a classic David Cross moment. Um, but then Mike Lazo responded to this comment. Dear David Cross, Jesus Christ, man, what a shitty thing to say. Like I could ever need your thinking. Certainly the most awesome thing I've ever read concerning myself. Dude, if you told me to air Icelandic at 4am, congratulations, I might offer you a job in programming, perhaps even development. However, if you're under the impression that you invented any sort of baffling late night television, then I must rescind any offer of a development staff position. Position. You might be too stupid. Overall, I'm in a good position to hook you up. I've been making unusual television at Turner almost 30 years. When I was much, much younger, I remember Bill Tush airing many commercial parodies on WTBS at, oh, let's see, 4 a.m. Uh oh, I ripped the shit out of that. Late night infomercials? Fuck yeah, original. Steal that shit. My idea. If your dumb fuck program, which we aired repeatedly for years and is not too bad actually, and good luck producing it anywhere else, was really all that good, we'd probably still be making it. I'm just one thief among many in the building, none of whom seemed the least bit shy about telling me to get right on with any genius David Cross concept. Unfortunately, you're just too expensive for your amazing 4am brain creations. Also, it seems you're totally a delusional dick. But look, it's not too late. Recently, I've been thinking what we could program at 1am. Maybe you and that other Mike Lazo expert, Meg Wright, can come up with another fresh parody idea I can steal. How about a showbiz crybaby series with some ignorant cut and paste commentary? Love, you're now total enemy, Mike Lazo. Now, I know we all like Adult Swim because it's not corporate and a little esoteric, and it seems like a chill place. This is wildly unprofessional. Like, I didn't think at all that Mike Lazo ripped off their idea before, but I kind of do now. That's not to say that the infomercials are bad retroactively because they stole their idea. The individual shorts had no involvement with either of them and didn't share any ideas beyond the baseline of being an infomercial parody. However, it seems that Adult Swim aired their short on TV. It's also worth noting that the version on YouTube, the official version posted by Adult Swim on the Adult Swim YouTube channel, was posted on February 13th, 2015 one day after the reddit ama happened i just know the ceo rushed to the social media guys room and demanded they post the special now at least they can get revenue from this excursion from you being wildly unprofessional this painful excursion and the response wasn't even the end of it david cross would then take to his facebook page on the 16th three days after the video was posted to argue some more hey everybody just wanted to post this response from john and i to mike lazo been running around but happy to finally get this out there here it be Mike, I totally agree. Calling someone a thief is a shit thing to say. But I don't know what else to call what you did. I mean, that is what it is. But let me address your response point by point. Well, I'm not sure what you mean when you write, like I could ever need your thinking. But I did tell you to air Icelandic at 4am under the heading of paid programming and, as well, urged you not to tell anyone about it so that people could enjoy the process of figuring out what the hell they just watched was. In fact, that's the whole and sole point of contention. So, you will offer me a job in programming. And possibly in development as well? Okay, well, thank you for that. But please, Mike, for the love of God, don't make me go over this a third time. 
Once more, here it goes. Neither John nor I believe, nor did we ever believe or claim or anything of that nature that we invented any sort of baffling late night television. Of course, we know that. I'm not mentally <laughs> nor did I just wake up out of a coma that I fell into in the early 50s. Once again, for the record, once again, I never said that. As well, I am fully aware, as I always have been, that neither John nor I invented making fun of late night infomercials. I can't state that enough, apparently. I agree, you have been making unusual and often great and wholly original television shows for quite some time now. Hell, I've appeared in a number of them, like literally dozens of various episodes from several shows. I'm not sure why you included the stock exchange abbreviation for Time Warner, but good for you. I am and remain a big fan of what you meant to TV in general. But again, the deviousness of taking John and I's idea as your own, that we can't forgive. Now, as you know, I grew up in Atlanta. As you may not know, I used to watch the Bill Tush show all the time. Loved it. Remember a young Jane Hooks? I do. I even remember when TV first stayed on air in Atlanta for 24 hours. It was Channel 11. 11 Alive was their slogan. Remember? I do. Okay, I just looked it up on Wikipedia. Tush was on at midnight. Any commercial parodies would have been within the context of his comedy show, so not the same thing. Maybe you mean when he did goofy news reports late tonight? I'm not sure what you're referencing, but again, again, AGAIN! We're not claiming that you ripped off our idea of a commercial parody. That would be an absurd claim, but let us continue. You then go on to call our show a dumb fuck program, and then in the very same sentence say that it's not too bad actually. That's confusing, it's one or the other. But then, to heap more confusion on top of a slowly building mound of confusionaltude, you say, again, in the very same sentence, if it was really all that good, you'd probably still be making it. What? And to make it even worse, this is in opposition to what you told my manager when he first contacted you after the Wall Street Journal interview, where you took credit for the idea and my manager asked you basically, Mike, what the fuck? Do you remember your reply? I do. It was this, and I quote, after viewing the pilot, we considered the idea too intellectual to build an audience. That is a direct quote from you about our show. Mike, you really need to think about your defensive posture here. You're all over the place. Pick one, but do try to stick to just one. It will help you in the long run if, when, other people call you on your bullshit. Now let's talk about the next thing you wrote, which also bothers me. You say that we're too expensive for our creations. Really, Mike? Go back and check the fucking contract. That show had a budget of $60,000. So you got an entire 11 and a half minute show for 60K. I would imagine that any other network would jump at that. That's insanely cheap for TV. And way, way below our going rate to create and deliver a finished show. But we agreed to it because we loved the idea and had a blast writing and producing it. Shit, I was remiss in skipping over the I'm just one thief among many in the building line you wrote. That is perhaps your weakest defense. By stating that, you must realize that you are throwing everyone you work with under the bus for something you and only you did. You and Matt Harrigan were the only ones in the room that day. I know you were antsy about possibly missing your tea time. True fun fact, Mike is crazy about golf and a mild addiction as it were. Ask anyone. But we talked about this idea for a good 30 minutes. I went over the arc of the show in detail. How it would end with the phase one is complete line with to be continued up on a card following. Then it would be eventually revealed that IUB was created by an alien race to eventually enslave Earth, blah, blah, blah. Again, there were only three people in the room, one of them being me. It's really shitty, very shitty, really, to lump in a building full of your co-workers and what you alone did. They're innocent. While I may in fact be a dick and most of the internet would agree with you there, I'm hardly delusional. Okay, that's it for now until you release another poorly written and suspect response. But... We did get one positive thing from all of this. John suggested Showbiz Crybaby would make an excellent heading on my tombstone. Yours in cutting and pasting, David and John. There are two important notes that are brought up in Cross's response. One, there were only four people in the room when it was pitched, three of which were Cross, John, and Mike, meaning that it was likely not a coincidence that the channel had the same idea they pitched. And two, the Icelandic Ultra Blue, what was going to be a series, was meant to continue with the same plot, and it would later be revealed that aliens were involved. And you could even see little hints of that throughout the special if you rewatch it, like the line where they say, when the astronauts first came to Earth. Oh, good, good. Well now, thanks to Icelandic Ultra Blue, you don't have to! New Icelandic Ultra Blue Embalm Bomb. 
It uses the same embalming fluid that the astronauts used when they first came to Earth. Honey, look, th there's a, uh, uh... Basically proving the purpose of me talking about nearly decade-old drama, that this is technically a failed pilot because the series they had planned was very different from what infomercials ended up being. Also, for a feud involving three people, this kind of seems like a 1v1. The post on David Cross's Facebook says it was made by David N. John, but... We can't ever really know that. And it very much reads like Cross's voice. Listen, I like David Cross. I think he's really funny and is involved with a lot of projects I like. However, I often find myself defending him a lot, which I don't really have to do for other people I like. And then Mike Lazo responded on Reddit the same day as the Facebook post. Uh, again, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say even before reading it that I he definitely didn't make anything any better Dear David Cross and John Benjamin. I enjoyed the rambling analysis of my letter and yes I remember Jan Bonnie and Terry Bill and Ted, but forgive me outside of lifting three eight-track tapes from riches when I was 15 I just don't remember stealing. I don't think you remember me stealing either. I think you read the considerable press about too many cooks and went batshit crazy with professional jealousy. Otherwise, why wait years after Icelandic to ding me with your classic professional slander? No matter, you've now reasonably informed me that the whole sole point of contention is that you told me to air Icelandic under the heading of paid programming and urged me not to tell anyone about it so that people could enjoy the process of figuring out what the hell they just watched. Okay, you're right. No doubt I blithely stole whatever that was. Didn't you tell me to? I am missing something else. Like we, David Cross and John Benjamin, want our just do money as creators of any Adult Swim 4 AM time period containing any such programs that people have fun producing. Okay, that's wrong. In your vivid memory of our meeting, do you recall any discussion of anything Adult Swim had made, was making, had scheduled, was scheduling, etc.? Or do we just talk about your project? Also, golf, which is great fun. Your agent? I told him that the project was too intellectualized to be admittedly and confusingly polite. But next time, hopefully, I'll just tell them no fucking way it was worth the money. Thieves in the building? Oh, yes, many, thankfully. It's the basic nature of creativity, you intellectual dimwits. And I'd say there goes the argument, but due to my love of poor writing, you will find these points confusing and incomprehensible. Ah, Sunday night, I close out this latest board edition with, if we made Icelandic all in for 60k, I swear to god, I will eat the category birthing giant live on television at 4am. And if we didn't, will you? Sincerely, Mike Lazo. We learned from Cross's second Facebook post that there was an overarching plot to their plan, and in Mike Lazo's second Reddit response, he calls it too intellectualized. And that's really the argument of me bringing this up. I'm not here to trudge up old celebrity drama. I don't even care about, I barely care about normal people drama. I'm bringing this up specifically in this video to ask the question, despite the sourness of who screwed over who, was the choice the right one? Because obviously I love the infomercials we got, and if they did go forward with the overarching ultra blue plan, we wouldn't have gotten classics like Live Forever As You Are Now, Too Many Cooks, Fart Copter, This House Has People In It, Fur Profit Online University, Unedited Footage Of A Bear, and The Broom Shakalaka. And by extension, I know this may be a little too deep, but would we have even gotten everything everywhere all at once? But part of me is curious as to what the plan series would have had in store. I'm a fan of both David Cross's and H. Sean Benjamin's work. I guess my hypothetical ideal situation is that we get the infomercials we have now but there's no falling out between the parties everyone's all buddy buddy again and we get to see david cross and h john benjamin back on the adult swim but it's too late for that eventually the publication vulture begins to cover the story which is when h john benjamin emails them with his side i was beginning to think he wasn't even involved and cross was just kind of dragging his name around hey america and mike lazo it's john one of the founding members of the dimwits pinch hitting for dave I'm not as nuanced as David, but I do have a boorish charm, so I'll try as best as I can to respond. I'm a fan of the romance genre, so I'll approach it from that vantage point. You stole our idea. Plain and simple. Nothing like Ultra Blue had ever been attempted until we did it. Your only creative contribution was giving us the forum to do it, and then your ethically dubious creative choice to rip it off and repeat it. As far as timing goes, I did bring attention to this shadiness when I wrote Matt Harrigan, a Lazo Lackey, back in 2012 when you first aired Michael Ian Black's show, I believe called Your Hole, which was an info ad parody aired at 4am. But to no avail. 
And we're supposed to be okay with your sage conceit that stealing ideas is the DNA of creative types like you that we're too dumb to know that? I'm sure you get ripped off and are none too pleased about it. Hell, I just saw a sprint ad that ripped off your text on screen ad campaign. Also, now that you bring up money, can't speak for Dave, but I do want some. I think you owe us. Every show that followed ours would not have been done without our initial concept that we gave you. You can obfuscate the truth all you want with all the musing on creativity, but that I know to be a fact. I know we had to hard sell Harrigan on the idea to push you to do it at 4am because it couldn't make money. You didn't want to do it, and then you later took credit for the idea. Another creative choice. Back to romance. Sometimes kids can act all mean to their schoolboy crushes and do bad things to them because they harbor some secret resentment against them. Maybe because they have this crazy ideal about them and know in their heart that that person will never like them back because deep down they know no one likes them. All this without even asking. Is David your secret crush? Or me? Probably David. He's more famous. Good night. John. P.S. Here's a copy of the budget, not including the 20k split for Dave and I for writing and producing, because why would you know about how much money that you gave us? You gave us a total of approximately 75k, not 60, so I guess you win the bet that I never accepted. Anyway, that would only serve to promote you and your network, but you already knew that. Why don't you eat that off camera? It would make more sense to me. John. The main point of this response is that we've dropped the hearsay and he came out of the woodwork with receipts. After all this, the very public falling out, H. John Benjamin and David Cross would not be involved with any new Adult Swim content as long as Mike Lazo was still around. But then Lazo stepped down in 2019, potentially leaving the door for their return. Of course, I'm sure they still have sour spots for the channel as a whole and have no reason to come back. However, I need a mystery hat. Hold on. I mentioned earlier that both these guys appeared on Aqua Teen. Benjamin literally appeared. He showed his face. There was a very popular season one episode titled Dumber Dolls that starred this guy, Happy Time Harry. Harry, like many characters, was voiced by David Cross, who then returned for the episode, the last one. After those episodes, all the ultra blue stuff happened and then Aqua Teen ended. Very sad. But Aqua Team would later return in 2022 with the short web series Aqua Donk Side Pieces. I've talked about it before. I talked about really not liking it, but there's something here. I wasn't a huge fan of the shorts because they were a little too short and only featured returning characters. But that's the thing returning characters. For the episode The Dumbest Doll of All, Happy Time Harry made his triumphant return. And it sounds so much like Cross, but he isn't credited anywhere. Not for the credits I had to slow down to read and not on the IMDB page for the episode. I don't even know who could have potentially replaced Cross because they only list four voices on the IMDB page and it's the main three and the new doll. There are, however, two extra voices credited in the credits that aren't credited on the official page. I said credits way too many times. So I searched up these two names individually and found nothing. Nothing for Sir Willops and nothing for Brightly Moore. After almost giving up, I put on my mystery hat and thought, hmm, maybe these two have worked together in the past, so I typed in both their names and got something. Sir Willops Brightly Moore, as credited, is the riff-off host for Pitch Perfect 2. He rides on a scooter and eliminates all of the teams and announces the winner of the riff-off. He owns a mansion. He is played by American comedian David Cross. And I was really excited about this, so I ran this by uh, the other swimmers. You know, I want to get their ideas on this. And I learned in doing so that he is credited with this name in the original episode with the doll, with Happy Time Harry. That season one episode, he's credited as this under a pseudonym. And what's even more interesting is that episode came out way before Pitch Perfect 2, meaning that he liked this name so much, he just used it for a different character. I don't know if anyone else has looked into this yet, but not only did David Cross return to voice one of his Aqua Teen characters after the Ultra Blue falling out, but he also refused to be credited with his name. And on one hand, maybe it's just consistency. He was credited that way in the original episode, so maybe he wanted to do it again just to like, you know, keep the dream going. Or maybe, just maybe, he didn't want to open up the door to Adult Swim quite yet, because he still hasn't been back on the channel. This was just on their, I was going to say website, this was on their YouTube. But if this is the only way we can get more David Cross and Aqua Teen, and it was supposed to be a secret, 
Sorry, I ruined it. But do you know what this means? This means that maybe David could work on more Aqua Team projects, which means that maybe H. John Benjamin could get involved again, which means, which means we could finally, finally get more Soul Quest Overdrive. I just really wanted to talk about that. Maybe everyone knew this and I'm just a chump thinking I solved a mystery all on my own. Uh, speaking of Aqua Teen spinoffs. <laughs> There's a very high probability you've seen this one, even if you didn't actually know what it was. That's because the Space Kataz pilot, which featured the Moonanites and Plutonians feuding, was rejected and split up and used as the cold openings for the third season of Aqua Team. The series was turned down because, quote, Adult Swim felt there was little, if anything, that could be done with the characters, which... Yeah. Like, I know it was early Adult Swim, and like a third of their roster was made up of spinoffs, but not everything needs a spinoff, you know? Look at Soul Quest Overdrive. And I mean, Aqua Teen was technically also a spinoff. And don't comment, oh, it was confirmed it wasn't a spinoff. Listen, I know Kentucky Nightmare or Baffler Meal, which one came, whichever. Whichever came out after, aired after Aqua Teen had already aired. I know that. But that episode was in development before Aqua Teen came out. Um, I'm just stubborn. I'm not going to change my mind, even with new information. Oh, but those characters are completely different. They don't even sound the same. I'll tell that to my favorite show, Soul Quest Overdrive. You can watch the fully constructed pilot on YouTube, which is taken from the extras of the season four DVD box set. I had always heard before that the pilot was just cut up into different scenes and those intervals were used as the code openings, but the pilot and the ones used in the show are ever so slightly different, which can be seen most easily in the Ding Dong Ditch clip. This is not a fight. This is a war! <laughs> What was it? I never knew these were meant to be one ongoing story as a kid. I just assumed they liked using these characters. And to be fair, even in the show, they do. Which is another thing. I don't know why you want to watch a show of these spin-off characters when they're still very much an active part of their home show. The Moon Knights had two separate episodes in season three, the season that used these cold opens. But upon watching the pilot in full, a lot more things make sense. Like I never knew the giant max of boxes were pizzas until I watched the whole pilot despite the previous cold open involving ordering the pizzas. Every episode of Aqua Teen Prior had a Dr. Weird cold open. The show is no stranger to cold openings. The reason this pilot works so well as these cold opens is because it's so rapid fire. The cold opens don't even feel like one story because there's so much happening in all of them. So I can't imagine what they possibly had planned for multiple episodes. I know it's good to make a great pilot, but you blew your wad from the jump. What more can you do? Aqua Teen and maybe Harvey Birdman are really the only spinoffs that worked. I mean, personally, I think the Brack show gets too much hate, but it was definitely unsuccessful. You think by a certain point they would learn their lesson and stop greenlighting these spinoffs of already existing shows? <clears throat> anyway. I mentioned this before, but if you're making a spinoff, you never want to revolve it around the comic relief character. People thought Cleveland Brown was funny, but he's not the main funny character. He's actually probably the least funny of this four. I guess it depends on how funny you find jokes. So no, he is the third funniest. I fucking hate that clip of Glenn going off on Brian as the camera zooms in and nothing else moves. I hate even more that people think it's a good scene. Brian and Stewie is not a good episode. Open your eyes, people. All oh, they have that sweet moment in the safe. He eats shit and poop. It's not, don't watch it, man. Anyway, yay, I get to talk about Frisky Dingo. Frisky Dingo has been around for a long time, but I only discovered it last year and absolutely fell in love with it. Created by Adam and Matt, but not the same Matt who created Aqua Teen and not the same Matt who worked on previous pilots. They got a lot of mats over there. The team that also created C Lab 2021 and Archer, both of which are shows I could never really get into. Sorry. Like, I definitely like Archer more, but I never finished it for some reason. If I'm brave enough to say I like Brack, then I'm also brave enough to say I don't like C Lab. I think my problem with both of these shows is that I tried to binge them from the beginning, and they weren't made for that. They were made for you to catch a random episode from a random season as it airs as a rerun, unless it's the episode that's just a uh, still frame for like eight minutes if not more. I'm pretty sure both of these shows get better in later seasons, but I just don't have the wherewithal to wait that long, and they aren't interesting enough for me to use the Clone Wars technique. But Frisky Dingo, spiritual successor to C-Lab, does not have that problem. Right off the bat, it's a fantastic mess of throwaway absurdities, becoming running gags that stack on top and intertwine with each other to create its own story language. If you want me to get into your show, keep calling back to running jokes. I did just mention the difference between binging a show and just catching an episode. And don't get me wrong, these episodes do stand on their own, but it excels when you watch them in order back to back. Even the dodgy parts that usually kind of kill the mood, the really bad accents, those turn out to be a joke because when the characters meet this person, they aren't like, oh, you're not from here. They're more like, oh, there's a white person doing a terrible accent. 
and they're actually right. You think the show is just gonna focus on some British constantly annoyed supervillain Killface and his rival, the douchey rich superhero Awesome X, also known as Xander Cruz. But then they start introducing side characters as throwaway jokes, just for jokes, and even they come back. Every character serves a purpose. Even those random LARPing nerds from episode one come back multiple times. There's an episode early on where Xander gets boy toy drawn across his chest, and it stays there for most of the series. Is it perfect? No, but there are parts that I really find funny, and honestly, that's all that matters. The funniest part of the show, at least for me, are Awesome X's team of robot-suited sidekicks, the Extacles. The Extacles work because we don't see their faces. There are some individuals who have names and act differently, but as a whole, it's one funny unit. If you ask me to pick a character or characters from the show to get their own spinoff, I would pick uh, Wendell. But then after that, I'd probably pick the Extacles. How many more mountains are we gonna crash into today? Mm, only three more. Okay, well, that's not so bad. Then the ship explodes. Well, then change course, you hey, douchebag. Nobody's doing anything until we get new orders. And I don't really have a problem with this one. The issue with the Aqua Teen spinoffs is that they wanted to run concurrent to the series, which would just split up manpower and take vital characters away from their own show. But the Exicle spinoff that only had two episodes made, that aired both on Adult Swim on November 10th, 2008, was made after the series had already ended. And Frisky Dingo ends on a cliffhanger, even though a lot of characters die at the end of season two. Season two isn't nearly as good as season one, it focuses too much on the presidential race that isn't really as funny as they think it is. But I'd take any opportunity to get more Frisky Dingo content, except for Archer. Well, maybe I'll give it another chance. I feel like I'm being too mean. But that makes it even more of a bummer that the X School show doesn't feel right. That's your Sammy! We're distributing cyanide caplets. Take them at your leisure. They've been made into fun shapes, like dinosaurs and rainbows. First off, by this point in the series, they had already changed their name to the Decepticals because they are more than you bargained for. A lot of the time when you're making a spinoff, you want to add characters to flesh out the main cast, especially if the main cast is faceless drones. But in the pilot, both episodes, they create like five Exicles who don't wear their helmets and add an AI to attempt to keep them on track. The AI idea is a good one, but the characters they made from the ground up are just not. The classic Frisky Dingo humor is still there, but it's coming from characters I don't really like. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Let's wait a minute, because maybe it'll burn some of the stink off. You never think this is going to happen to you, but it's happening! Oh my god! Oh god, no, it's getting worse. Put it out. No! And it's not even biased, because I do really like the original Exicles, but I'm not against change. But I think showing their faces fundamentally misunderstands what makes the Exicles funny. Evidently, Adult Swim felt the same way and turned down the series after airing two episodes back to back. What's funny is that the schedule guide I always use lists these episodes right next to each other as new series and series finale. Ouch. Shout out to cnas.fandom.com. I couldn't have done it without you guys. I couldn't have done any of this, really. Shortly after the show was rejected, the duo that was with Adult Swim from the jump would pitch a new idea about a character similar to Xander Cruz, but he's a spy to the FX channel. That show would be called Archer. I don't know why I'm introducing it, like I didn't mention it a bunch before. And it would be a huge hit, and because of how long it ran, the two would never really return to Adult Swim for any other projects. And who was the voice of Archer from Archer? H. John Benjamin. Makes you think. I don't know what I'm implying by that. They're all against me. They're in my walls. It's also funny that one of the, I believe the co-creator of Home Movies went on to make Bob's Burgers also for Fox, which also has H. John Benjamin and Kristen Shaw. Okay, we're spiraling. So if we're looking at the potential split timeline universe where these pilots got made, in the universe where the Exicles took off, Archer would have never gotten made. And while I don't love Archer, they made a really touching tribute to Jessica Walters after her passing, and I could never mess with that. Maybe someday I will give Archer another chance. I mean, I do need to fill this frisky dingo shaped hole in my ass. That's a reference to the Exticles pilot, which you guys haven't seen. Huh. Okay, I show the clip. <laughs> I mean, if you want, you could just watch these pilots uploaded on YouTube. And as a nice little treat, it's very clearly uploaded in 2008. But upon looking it up, you'll actually see a lot of Exticle clips because they were really popular at the time, more so online than in the actual show. To be fair, I'd say about half of my Adult Swim enjoyment at the time when I was a kid was from watching blurry 240p Robot Chicken and Aqua Teen clips on the family computer and then probably getting a virus. And Adult Swim picked up on this. They realized they were getting popular on the internet at the time. I mean, they picked up internet creators like Brad Neely and then later Jack Stauber, Lee Hartcastle, Michael Cusack, and another goblin we'll get into later. But before all that, in the year 2008, Adult Swim had their eyes on a bigger prize. What was possibly the most viral internet cartoon at the time, and also 
the video that got me into YouTube. The only reason I'm here. Listen, whenever I talk about other YouTubers, I talk with like, as they're my peers with the utmost respect, but I'm about to gush and be a fanboy for a while, so you guys are just gonna have to manage. Hello there, Mr. Swim. My name is Charlie the Unicorn, and I'm here to pitch you our little show. Ch charlie We're coming to get you, Charlie! We're coming to get you! I don't think I've really talked about this, at least not in depth, but Film Cow means a lot to me. Film Cow, formerly uh, Secret Agent Bob on YouTube and Newgrounds, is still to this day my favorite YouTuber who's still going from when I started watching. Like even back in the day, I liked Ryan Higa and Smosh. Oh, I also wrote this script before Smosh came back. So that kind of throws a wrench in what I'm saying. And I even became a really big fan of the mean kitty, but that's a story for another time. But Film Cow was always my favorite. I was absolutely obsessed with their content. And Film Cow, unlike a lot of those channels, not to throw shade, but you know, just times change, still makes fantastic content to this day. Again, it doesn't work when I bring up Smosh. I never like to gatekeep things, especially not a YouTube channel, but I die a little inside when they call Jason the Charlie the Unicorn or the Llamas with Hats guy. I say they because there's an alternating cast of returning voices and faces, and if you've seen every single Film Cal project like I have, you start to recognize them. That's right, I've even seen the Grill one and Edward Spatula hands. I've been watching from the joke. I'm kind of embarrassed when people saw my old videos that I privated, so I don't want to be like that, but... It had an effect on me. I was a huge fan. I am a huge fan. It was run and directed by Jason Steele, the mastermind of the channel, who voices most of the characters, but tends to stay behind the camera in the live action stories. And I didn't even notice as a kid or know when I was watching these movies, we called them movies back in the day. We got to bring that back. How inspired by Adult Swim they were. The cloak legitimately feels like an episode of Frisky Dingo. All the characters are animated like Space Ghost where they bob up and down. The team that inspired me so much as a kid, and let's face it, as an adult, I don't know how true it is, but seems to be early Adult Swim inspired, so the pilot at least makes sense. It was Film Cal that got me into internet animation and animation as a whole that it could be something greater, and to watching YouTube videos regularly inspiring me to write and film sketches with my friends. I'm letting you guys know with 100% positivity that if I never found Film Cal, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I mean, you're not here, but I wouldn't be doing this right now. I even downloaded the free sound effect pack he made around the Nickelodeon video, and I used those for the Cat Scratch comic part of that video when I was reading it, I was jumping up and down and getting giddy and pointing at the screen, being like, that's a scream from five minutes into Special Madness, which is a movie I've watched thousands of times. On top of Charlie the Unicorn being my first ever video, I also downloaded everything. I don't know why this was possible at the time or why they stopped doing this, but back in the day, iTunes would basically allow anyone to upload videos to their service and then people could download those videos. I had an iPod touch, which meant I only had internet access when I was by a place with Wi-Fi. There was no data. And remember, this was late 2000s, early 2010s. So if I wanted to watch videos while we were supposed to be at recess or on the bus ride to school, I needed to download them from iTunes ahead of time so they were saved onto my iPod. So I basically just looked for anything free on iTunes. So I downloaded every film cow movie that was allowed on iTunes, and I downloaded the first episode of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. Even back then, I had a thing for irony, I guess, and I thought I was being funny and quirky, like, huh, isn't this silly that I'm a guy who likes My Little Pony Friendship is Magic? I, I bet I'm the only guy doing this. Man, I'm being so weird. I later found out that was not the case and then I stopped watching the show. I bought a Flutter Chai doll. Like, that's a real thing I owned. I think I threw it out, but I spent real money. Uh, anyway. I downloaded on top of every Film Cow video. I'm talking Detective Mittens, Bino the Elephant, The Animal, Gods of Olympus, which I showed all my friends on the bus and got all of them invested. We were like eight or nine, and one of the characters, we would pretend to be the characters while playing at the park that our parents allowed us to go to, and one of those characters was Chris Brown, Okay, so maybe the videos weren't appropriate for kids. I see a lot of posts now of like little children dancing with like skibbity toilet or whatever. And while I don't think kids should have unadulterated internet access, I was basically doing the same thing. And I, I, I never wanna say I turned out fine because that's not true. On top of that, I listened to both of Jason's podcasts, Chaos Pony and Noxcast, both of which have sort of gone missing and don't really have a fan base and kind of fell under the radar and you can't really listen to them. Except I can, because I backed them up a long while ago, and I still go back to them intermittently. I should reiterate, this was the late 2000s, and I was listening to podcasts at the ripe old age of seven. If the name Knox stands out to you, it's because the creator Robert Benfer, formerly known as Knox Corner, was the co-host of both of these podcasts along with Jason. As a kid, I watched Film Cow and Clay World completely independent of each other. I didn't even know they knew each other. Despite Knox making a voice cameo in The Cloak, I wasn't grown up enough to be annoying and point at the screen and be like, ah, oh, I know that voice. So when I found out my two 
favorite creators had a radio show together, my little brain exploded. Real quick, I mentioned earlier, I don't love it when Jason is referred to as the Charlie guy, so I think I should make a point to say that Robert Venfer, Knox's human alternative, also makes fantastic stuff that isn't just Clay World. It's mostly music. I like the music. My old roommate came up to me one day and asked if I had seen this old video called Pickle Jar. Have I seen Pickle Jar? Yeah, I had it downloaded on my iPod Touch when I was eight years old. So on top of their podcast and Jason's videos, I also downloaded all of Robert's Clay videos and songs. Both of these guys were huge inspirations for me, and the podcast gives some insight but don't watch it. Like, I imagine the reason it's kind of lost is because they tried to delete them for a reason, but emotionally and nostalgically, they mean a lot to me. I never thought I'd be one of those guys. I, I described it as like George Lucasing, and I've never like gone back to change anything, but I always wanted to leave up my older videos so people could tell how far I've come. Cause I, I like doing that with other people's content, sorting by oldest and watching their videos from like 2009 and being like, wow, I mean, they've been doing this for a long time. You can see their growth, but I got so embarrassed by like my older videos. I just privated them. Some of you have seen them have reached out to me and be like, hey, I like this. This is charming, you know? Look at this little kid doing this stuff, but they're, they're so embarrassing to me. So as much as I want to be the lost media guy and be like, oh, here it is, here's the archive. If it's another creator, I imagine they deleted them again for a reason. I don't want to to each their own. If they want them to be off the internet, I am inclined to go along with that. At least I can listen to them. Ha ha. However, if you completely overlooked my judgment and you're super determined to watch these, any of them, just watch Chaos Pony. It's the much better show and more up to date. But if you have to listen to Noxcast Radio, listen to the library. It's the best one. And then I exploded when I saw an inside joke that was originally just made for the podcast made into a video with That's Our Robert. Again, Robert Benfer appearing on the Film Cow channel. This is no longer a video about Adult Swim pilots. I got Got all my friends and the five families I interacted with all invested and we would all gather around when a new video dropped. Oh, that Solway God of Mercy. For like a month, they would release weekly installments of a show called Hit It With A Car and Dark Midnight, which I absolutely love and feel like, again, not enough people talk about. It's fine if you like Charlie the Unicorn, but he's done so many other interesting things. Chris Alex needs to be in more projects. And it wasn't just my childhood. Detective Heart of America, The Final Freedom dropped when I was in high school and I still forced all my friends to watch it. I never changed. It's the only reason I still talk about the to this day. I mean, I quote these videos all the time. Every now and again, I watch the whole playlist from start to end again, but I know these videos like the back of my hand. Around the same time, the Merlin reacts to the Fine Bros and its Cake Boss videos dropped, and I quote those to people who don't even know the context. Really, this whole video from the jump was just an excuse for me to gush over my favorite YouTuber. Everyone else I'm totally professional about, like, oh, let's shake hands. Yeah, maybe I've heard of you, but I, Film Cow, I'm gonna fanboy over. I have been a fan since I was a little boy. I know there's a lot of pilots I told you guys you should watch because they're short and on the internet, but forget all of that. Your new homework is to watch every single Film Cow video, for better or for worse. Even if they're not on the Film Cow channel, you find them. Trust me, you can find them. Yeah, like some of my favorites, like Mr. Happy Face and World of Dentists, aren't on the main channel, so you're gonna have to do some digging. And again, I'm a little torn. Before I became a YouTuber, I was always confused and upset as to why creators would delete their old stuff, and then I became a YouTuber, and now I get it. You shouldn't listen to this podcast. I imagine they buried them for a reason. They're just for me. I will say, I don't even know if I could find the clip because I, I listened to it like earlier this year because that was originally going to be its own video. Then I decided against it because it was too daunting. But Jason tells a story on the podcast about visiting the Tom Goes to the Mayor cast or staff rather. And I it blew my mind. Yeah, Tom Goes to the Mayor. It's, uh, it's a show that airs on Cartoon Network. And uh, well, they had they have their uh, office building in uh, Los Angeles. And I happened to be in Los Angeles that week, and uh, so I decided to drop by and say hello, just because I didn't know anyone there. But so I went to the building because I, I <laughs> found. Drop by and say hello. <laughs> so I, I, I dropped by the building. I found because I found out the name of their production company, and I looked it up, and it happened to be listed. I went to their building, and the the uh, the side door was open. I guess it was supposed to be locked, but it was open. So I went in, and I went into the... <laughs> they had a little elevator lift thing there, and it, uh, it was for uh, dip shot films. So I went in the elevator, and I, I uh, pressed floor three, I think it was, which was dip shot films, and I went up. Door opened up, and sure enough, there's all the production offices for Tom Goes to the Mayor. So I walk in, and I start looking around, and, <laughs> and some guy comes up to me, and, he, <laughs> and he's like, Hey, uh, can I help you? And I was like, Oh, no, we were just uh, around, and we decided to stop in and say hi. I was uh, with with my uh, friend uh, Matt and my my stepsister Donna. Oh, I see. And so we were we were there, and <laughs> she was like, "Hey, can I can I help you guys?" And like, "No, we were we were just in here and uh, decided to say stop in and say hello." And the guy was like, "Okay, do you uh, do you know anyone here?" And I was like, "No, <laughs> I don't know anyone here." 
And he just kind of stood there and looked at me for a second and tried to figure out what was uh, what was going on. Because I, if we were like there to steal something or kill everyone or something, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, then uh, Tim of Tim and Eric, who create the show, walked in and uh, he said hello, and I sh- shook his hand. And he, he he was actually pretty cool. He gave me a tour of the uh, the whole area, and then he gave me uh, two shirts, two oh, wow, T-shirts. Sure. They said uh, "Rats off to you." It's a catchphrase from one of the episodes. Oh, I see. Jason Steele, Film Cow, is still making fantastic content to this day. The Charlie the Unicorn finale was legitimately one of the most moving pieces of animation I watched in 2021, and I was there live as it premiered. It means a lot to me. I think legitimately Charlie the Unicorn may have been my first ever YouTube video. So as much as I don't want him to be known as the Charlie the Unicorn guy, I'm projecting onto him. Uh, I don't want to be the total drama guy. The series means a lot to me. And I don't want to spoil anything, but Charlie's singing for the first time in canon, uh, because the first time he actually sang was in the trailer or commercial for the DVD, the Film Cow Master Collection, which is also, I think, an unlisted video, but I, okay, I gotta move on. And as of writing this, he's wrapping up his Shadowstone Park series, which was originally a Verve exclusive, and we all know how Verve turned out. He is fathoms bigger than me and a YouTube legend, but if I can convince even a small percent of you that aren't fans of his to become fans, then me showing my ass and Bearing my heart like this will have been worth it. Anyway, uh, the pilot. Hey everyone, what you're about to watch is a video pitch I did back in 2007. Adult Swim contacted me about possibly turning Charlie into a TV show, and so I got together with my friend Matt Books to discuss how to make Charlie more adult swimmy, and then I put together this video to pitch the show. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it would have been would have been terrible. This pitch is pretty bad. There's horrible new characters and well the whole thing was put together in like two days so it's all a little awkward. It worked though. This got me a contract which I turned down so there could have been a Charlie show but it would have been a bad Charlie show. Well here's the pitch. The explanation Jason gives before showing the pitch is correct. It's not super solid. And also I love Adult Swim to death. That's why I'm making these videos to share all the info jammed in my head. But in 2007 he made the right decision. Like the options are either you go viral multiple times and make YouTube money back when YouTube money was a thing you wanted and was good actually, and make a ton of custom merch that you reap all the benefits from because you made the shirt sold in a hot topic and people will buy them. Or it becomes a cult classic that significantly less people watch at 3 a.m. I'm sorry, it's true. I love Adult Swim, but he made the right decision. And also Adult Swim is raunchy and for adults, but at the time you could get away with way more on YouTube than you could on TV. It's kind of weird how stuff is switched where YouTube seems so cool back in the day because it's like, oh man, you could say all the things and do whatever you want that you can't even do on, on TV. And then I was watching, I think Royal Crackers, I know I keep bringing it up, and they said, you're like ruining my idea or something. Um, and I was shocked because I hadn't heard that word in years because you, you can't say, I mean, for good reason, but you can't say that on the internet without getting your shit shut down. In 2007, he made the right call and the comments seem to agree. My purpose here is to talk about all these failed adult swim pilots and how I feel they would have hypothetically worked. So nobody's going to click on that. So the video is probably titled like adult swims, biggest miss opportunities or something dumb and stupid like that. I'm not here to say that adult swim missed out big time by not picking up this show because it was Jason that turned them down. However, I've never seen anyone talk about this Charlie pitch before. I found it on a whim when showing my Twitch chat Dad Cop 2, which also appeared at the end of this pitch for some reason. So please give our show a chance. We promise it will be annoying, unmarketable, and repetitive. If I catch you downloading this disc, I'm gonna I'm gonna break down your door and commandeer your mom! Dad Cop 2 dropped on my birthday in 2009, so I feel some kind of cosmic connection to it. Also, despite still having some 2000s isms, you know, uh comes with the territory, I still quote it to this day. Also, on the very slim chance Jason is seeing this, if he does, I'm gonna pee my pants and melt. How the hell did you get this shot of Dad Cop 2 on top of the car? Even as an adult, I can't figure, like as a kid, I'm like, oh man, it's a, it's a special effect, but it, I don't think it is. Like, I, if it's an effect, then it's the best effect I've seen from a YouTube video in 2009. Anyway, speaking of characters making cameos, Film Cow has a history of reusing designs or hinting at designs they would use in the future. Mr. Happy Face and the yet to be released Bino the Elephant appear as toys in the background of the cloak, along with the Leo Pluridon from Charlie the Unicorn. And in this pilot, we see that the mayor design would later become the detective with some minor changes. If you're not a Film Cow fan, this is probably not gonna, you're just gonna have to trust me on this, man. I've remembered all these videos back to front. And one of the many episode ideas he pitches has the subtitle of The Marshmallow People. Some example episodes would be 
the marshmallow people. Light, fluffy, and deadly. What horrors are in store for Charlie and the gang when they accidentally burn down Marshmallow Castle? And if you're a hardcore film cow fan, so me, uh, you know that the Marshmallow people were reworked into their own series. The only thing worth noting that would maybe make this show worth it a little bit is that every Charlie the Unicorn web episode features a song and the television show would have probably followed suit. And if you're a hardcore BH Ultra fan, so me, uh, you know I love animated musical numbers. But this wouldn't be the last time Film Cow would pitch a horse-related animated TV pilot. Angela, this is really important to me. I'm about to have the most critically acclaimed and financially successful TV show in the history of time and creation, so I super need to party about it. Okay, but what do I tell all the people coming to my party? Oh, don't worry, I already called them all and canceled. They'll be at my place. The Magical Realm of Horseman was a short-lived Film Cow series that featured a ton of characters played by classic Film Cow regulars from Jason's films. If I was ever given an opportunity to pitch a show, I would also put my actor friends in it. And I do really like Horseman throughout middle school, me and my friends quoted it a lot, but if I were to pick a film cow series to become a show, to pitch a pilot, it would not be this. There's no direct proof that this pitch was shown to Adult Swim, but I know it was pitched around to multiple different channels, and there's really no reason to leave Adult Swim out when you're trying to pitch an adult animated absurdist show. Like, yeah, you could air it on FX along Archer, but... Would you? And Horseman is very strange. Adult Swim doesn't have a monopoly on strange animated content, but I don't know who else would have wanted this. I want it, but that's just me. But Andrew, I thought Jason already knew he didn't want a TV contract. What happened between 2007 and 2013 that could have possibly changed his mind? 2012, the year YouTube changed the way views and AdSense would be calculated and distributed. You see, back in the day, um, I'm sure you know, I assume everyone who watches this is around my same age range or older. If you're a doo-doo diaper baby, uh, go to bed. All kids out of the pool. Back in the day, YouTube was full of short sketches and animations that would take a long time to produce, but it was worth it because how the views worked. Prior to 2012, every time someone clicked on your video, you would get a view. And if you had ads enabled on your channel, you would get some change. And that was good for short form content. That's why it thrived. The only downside is that people would take advantage of the system through clickbait. I'm not saying people don't still put boobs in their thumbnail to get views. I'm just saying that they did it a lot more in the early days of YouTube. And it wasn't just boobs. It was any kind of clickbait. If they got you to click on their their video they got your money that's why it's called clickbait except it wasn't your money really it's not like you're paying them but they did waste your time for a couple seconds when people talk about this they really demonize it like it's the worst thing ever but at the very worst it's like a minor annoyance so youtube changed the way that viewers would calculate through watch time a view would only count and you would only get paid if that viewer watched 10 minutes so a lot of people stretch their videos to 10 minutes when they could have realistically been like five or six and that combined with the internet and streaming changing how youtube content was consumed youtube videos got longer and longer and now every video is like multiple hours long when they could have just been a couple minutes <clears throat> um, it was great for people making longer content, especially gaming content that requires very little work, if at all. But it killed animators. They could spend months producing one cartoon that wouldn't even turn a profit because it wasn't long enough. And it's a bummer because I loved the YouTube animation space. I still do. But it was tough to watch all my favorite animators eventually scramble and pivot their careers. I do enjoy the Let's Plays though. Film Cow was my first and my favorite, but he wasn't the only YouTube animator I got into as a young lad. This is a story of two friends, Chris and Zach. They live in a world surrounded by not so normal things. The legitimately the only podcast I listened to prior to like 2018 boom uh, were from my favorite animators. Anyone who regularly watched animations on YouTube in the early 2010s has likely seen Hellbenders. And if not, at least they know about the co-creators and star of the show, Zachary Hadel and Chris O'Neill. Hellbenders is very 2012, if that makes sense. When I first saw it as a kid, I watched the episodes multiple times until it got engraved into my head and still sticks with me to this day. I mean, I liked all the people involved. The seven people involved in the first episode were all part of a podcast that ruined my life from a young age. You see, all these new fans only know Zach from his television show on Adult Swim and classics such as Best of Zach and Best of Zack Volume 2. And when I say episodes, of course I mean web episodes. The first video in the series, Appalooza, 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 is four minutes long. The ice cream short released earlier that year to tease the series didn't even break a minute, and the Christmas special released at the end of that year only clocked in at three. All three of these episodes released within the same year, which for YouTube animation is no easy feat, but it might have something to do with the fact that they are very short. Me calling these videos short may sound like an insult, but then you clearly don't know me very well because 
because I hate having my time wasted. The reason these videos are funny and work so well is because of how fast paced they are. Rapid fire jokes. I went back and watched all of them and while I didn't find Appaloosa as funny as I remembered, but it could have something to do with the fact that I've seen it a thousand times over and it's kind of like immortalized and mythologized in my brain as opposed to viewing it as just a YouTube video. But A Hellbender's Christmas is the best one. It's still great. And we just talked about how YouTube gutted the animation community on YouTube in 2012. So what are these two funny men to do after putting so much time and effort same thing into this cartoon and they all did really well why not go the way of horseman and pitch their series to an actual television channel i mean they have the talent and they have the popularity this story the story that follows this the story i'm about to say the story you're about to hear is mostly hearsay i always do my best to try and substantiate the quotes and rumors surrounding a project but i legitimately could not find sources to most of this stuff so i'm going to tell you what people think and say happened but i'm not going to say if it's for sure because it very likely could not be it's highly popular possible that none of this happened at all. The timeline is we know Chris and Zach pitched Hellbenders around to somebody, most likely Adult Swim, but we never got to see that pitch or pilot, not at the time, until the year 2017, where the pilot was uploaded on YouTube. And you can watch the pilot right now, really, if you want to. But in my opinion, I don't think it really works. Ah, oh, it's purring. Can you, can you hear her? She is purring. Go ahead and give her a stroke, big boy. I saved you! No, you didn't! You killed the poor spider! Like, the creators were incredibly embarrassed that the unfinished and unedited versions got posted because it was, well, unfinished. But honestly, upon watching it, the unfinished animatic is not the problem. I just don't know if Hellbenders works in 11 minute format. I was also excited about the prospect of Hellbenders on Adult Swim at the time because I liked both of those things. And I knew everyone involved had the capability to be funny because I've seen all their combined projects and listened to their fucking podcast. However, if I was an Adult Swim exec, I think I would have passed as well. This doesn't mean I don't like the talent behind it because I do think they can make something really great and they have made something really great. They were just a couple years too early and they likely would have been better off pitching an entirely new show. And in the end, that did happen. Zach Hadel would get another shot by pitching Smiling Friends with more talent and years of experience under his belt to Adult Swim. And now it's the most popular thing they have. I don't know where people fall on Rick and Morty now because a lot of Rick and Morty stuff happened this year while I was writing this video, but... Maybe it's more popular. Not as popular as Pibby though. Am I right, Pibby heads? Uh, how, how's the Pibby gang doing today? Again, we're talking about hypothetical situations and split timelines. Maybe if Smiling Friends never happened, I'd be more upset and clamoring for more Hellbenders. But considering I know the timeline we're in, I wouldn't have it any other way. All right, I've been mean for absolutely no reason to people I respect a whole lot, or at least did when I was uh, younger. So it kind of like tracks. Now time for the story. The story, if YouTube comments under the leaked pilot are to be trusted, which of course, journalistic integrity, why not believe random comments, is as follows. That Adult Swim liked the pilot completely and had no problems with it whatsoever, but they just turned it down because they already had too many shows about hell and they just greenlit shitty Mr. Pickles and not this piece of modern art. First off, the only sources I could find of this are YouTube comments, famous for getting everything right all the time, always. Second off, what the fuck are you talking about? Adult Swim's worried about being too demonic? Again, not trying to be a dick, but if you check the episode on the Hellbenders wiki, it says that Adult Swim turned it down because it was the worst pitch they had ever seen. And while I'm more partial to believe wikis over YouTube comments, again, none of this has really been substantiated. There's no like specific sites, it's just, this is a quote that happened, probably. The only actual response we have is that when the leaked pilot was posted to Reddit, Zach Hadel commented, Hey co-creator on this, just to clarify a few things. One, this was heavily edited for absolutely no reason. About half the scenes were completely cut out from even the first version of this that leaked. I've no idea why someone would deliberately edit out a good amount of scenes and upload this. If the scenes were edited out because they felt incomplete, it's because they are. This is not a complete project. Chris and I always worked on Hellbenders by doing rewrites and redoing lines until we found the perfect balance. The original version of Appalooza was awful, but we edited it down heavily and moved things around. It's why I feel so weird about having this up. It's like looking at a half-cooked meal and saying, this looks awful, I wouldn't eat this. I'm totally fine with people not liking the project, but at least wait until it's done. Two. No, this didn't take three years to make. It took about four to five months of storyboarding and animation with a very tiny team that was two guys most of the time. Keep in mind, it ultimately ended up being about 15 minutes, and we dealt with a very tiny budget. 
the other two plus years went to us figuring out what this series would be, where it would go, etc. While the people we were partnered with renegotiated the contract a bunch of times so we owned everything and it would be fair, which we ultimately ended up getting at the end of it. This comment kind of makes it seem like it was their move to back out and not Adult Swim's. And then another post talking about it happened on r slash Oni Plays. One of two responses says, It was never a show to begin with. After declining Adult Swim's offer, they worked on the pilot for another network who paid them peanuts. Okay, so what the fuck? Who is this guy? Where did you hear that? At the end of the day, unless outright said by the creators of the pilot, we may never know what transpired and why it didn't go forward. Which is a bummer, but in the long run, I think everyone turned out the better than they would have if they gone forward with the Hellbender show, especially if it was them who turned down the offer. Hellbenders just doesn't really work in 15 minute doses, but Smiling Friends does. As much as I sing the praises of Adult Swim utilizing internet talent, Hellbenders was always a web series and Smiling Friends was developed first and foremost as a show. Sorry to dredge up this story again when the creators don't really like engaging with this project anymore, but I just wanted to cover it because everyone constantly quotes other YouTube comments about what happened when the truth is we don't know what the truth, we don't know what happened. You guys gotta start thinking about where your info comes from. Pibby is definitely gonna be a series because the guy on 4chan said so. You wouldn't last a day in the Smash Bros speculation sphere. Ah! I'm sorry about the Pibby jokes, except not really. I like Pibby conceptually, but you guys gotta let it go. And now we can move on from that to the final pilot. I've dragged you guys long enough through the pilots that were just okay. Pilots that were good, or pilots that I didn't really think should be a show, but wanted to talk about. Honestly, this is just an excuse for me to um, talk about old YouTube animation and people I've been fans of for a long time. But this last pilot is funny. It's got a unique art style. It's got great voice talent, and the story surrounding it is tied to even more theorizing and hearsay. Yay! <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take everything I'm about to explain with a pinch of salt. I never thought I would be like a drama channel talking about all this stuff. I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm kind of a fan of the video game company Valve. They've made a video game or two. Never three though. I've talked about Half-Life a lot and I've talked about Portal to death, but I never really talked about their third biggest game, at least not to the degree I probably should have. Team Fortress 2, a game I never really got into because you can't use a controller and I will jump headfirst into Bramble before I ever play a shooter with keyboard and mouse. What do I look like? A loser? Let's see what my Valve Steam Deck has to say about no controllers. And then I tried playing it again in modern times, but it was overrun with bots. So I guess it's just kind of a huge internet phenomenon that I completely missed the boat on. If I can't play a game, I can at least hear the legend and old rumors of events while watching all these Source Filmmaker animations Valve made for each character. If you don't know what Source Filmmaker is, yeah, you do. You just probably don't know the name of it. Source Filmmaker is a 3D posing and animation tool published by Valve. If you've been on the internet long enough, you've likely seen a video animated in Source Filmmaker, maybe toilet videos. It's fine. I'm not gonna be old about this. Their easy to use but hard to master system made it really popular. Because while anyone can puppet corpses around, very few can make beautiful projects like the ones you're probably seeing behind me. Oh, it's right behind me, isn't it? TF2 characters were very popular among these animations. Probably has something to do with their fantastic design. I can't talk about the gameplay, but I can talk about these characters. I'm sure you've heard this before and probably from people who understand art better, but the best character designs can be recognized just by their silhouettes. And if you line up all the characters as silhouettes, you can still tell who's who. You made some kick-ass character design. It also helps that they're inspired by mid-50s rebellious pop art. And even beyond their designs, their characteristics were fleshed out more in the animated shorts they made for each character. The game with little to no dialogue has some of the most well-understood characters in gaming. At the same time, Valve had a very good relationship with Adult Swim. I mean, they had a promotion in TF2 where you could buy Adult Swim character hats in the lead up to the new season of The Venture Bros. I've seen this Brock heavy so many times, but I could never place where it came from here. It came from these ads. This is where it originated. They even did a TF2 sketch on Robot Chicken, and I know Robot Chicken covers some obscure stuff sometimes, but there's no way they did this because they thought it was relevant. I think they just like the game, which is fine. This was 2012, 2013. Evidently, completely coincidentally, uh, Valve was working on a lore script for some kind of TF2 project. So when Adult Swim approached Valve to make a Team Fortress show in the style of the Meet the Shorts, they decided, 
Oh, why don't we just use the outline we just wrote already, completely coincidentally. So the plan was to make 10 short episodes for the first season, which would fill a 15 minute slot each. But if you know anything about TV or watch as much as I did as a kid and got super obsessed with timing and schedules, you know that a 15 minute episode is not a 15 minute episode. Regardless of how long your show is, every commercial break lasts four minutes. It just depends on how many commercial breaks you have. So 15 minute episodes, a quarter of an hour, are actually 11 minute episodes with four minutes of ads. 30 minute episodes have two commercial breaks one in the middle and one at the end, which are each four minutes, which adds up to eight. So those would be 22 minutes, which is why you probably notice that whenever you watch an old show on streaming, that the episode lengths are always either 11 minutes, 22 minutes, or 44 minutes. Over an hour block, your show is actually 44 minutes with different four minute ad intervals filling in different gaps. Valve did not know this. So they produced a pilot that was 15 minutes in length. And then when Adult Swim told them they had to cut it down, they immediately lost interest. In classic Valve fashion, it took Adult Swim forever to hear back from them until eventually Adult Swim just figured it wouldn't be worth it to go through for nine more episodes, considering it took this much hassle to make one. If episode one took several months, how long would the entire show take to make? The first season. So nothing ever came of this alleged Adult Swim Team Fortress 2 pilot. One of Valve's writers who was put in charge of the TF2 comic, the same TF2 comic where it's revealed that the scout, the fast talking scatterbrain with a Boston accent whose face looks like this, it's revealed that his name is Jeremy. And I don't know what you're talking about, man. I think you need to shut your mouth. The little guy has a mouth on him, I think. That's too bad. What's going on in here? I get to fry luck. They used a lot of the ideas planned for the show in the comic. So if you're really interested in the prospect of TF2 lore, I suggest giving it a read. We will never know what came of this pilot. Sort of. Remember the meet the shorts I mentioned earlier? I called them meet the shorts, but you get my gist. Well, they weren't only shorts Valve made. They uploaded a ton of couple minute short animations to the official TF2 YouTube channel. And then one day in 2014, a year after we know the show planning happened, Valve would post a new animation to their official TF2 channel. A 15 minute long animation that sets up a lot of character relationships and has nothing to do with the current TF2 update, almost like it wasn't meant to. I don't know, guys. What other Valve made TF2 cartoon do we know was approximately 15? minutes. That was the problem with it. So yes, it's widely believed that the episode expiration date, which is now sitting at 37 million views, was the proposed Adult Swim pilot. And it's a shame that this whole thing panned out like this, and I might be biased because I like both of these companies, but it's, it's legitimately fantastic. Our first dying wish is Scouts. He's drawn a picture of me getting hit by a car. I have something radiating off of me. Yeah, those are stink lines. That's why the car hit him. Because he smells. Yes, I see. This is the only plot I've watched for this video that I'm legitimately bummed did not become a show. It helps that the Valve team is really funny, but anyone who's played Portal or Portal 2 can tell you that. And I'm sure they will tell you that. Eventually. It has 37 million views for a reason. It is constantly funny. This is a bucket. Dear God. There's more. No. Like there are shows that have funny jokes and there are shows that tell a lot of jokes, but very few properties can tell an onslaught of constantly funny jokes consistently. It's witty. All the characters dialogue flows perfectly to not only maximize jokes per minute, but also helps characterize the cast. There's a bunch of team members here that only get one or two lines, but you can still decipher each single character and how they work as a team, which isn't to say that there isn't way more they could do with the concept, which there is. This episode is mostly focused on Scout and Spy's love-hate relationship. Most TF2 fans want all the characters to fuck each other, which is, I I understand. I get it. Trust me, I get it. But I think Jeremy and the spy have a more father and son role going on this episode. That mentor that helps you through life's challenges, but also someone Scout doesn't respect that much. The spy is really funny, but my outstanding favorite in this episode is the soldier. Fantastic. This was a huge waste of my time. You did not read mine. <sighs> Does it say you want the buck? Yes. See you all in hell. It's pretty hard to make a dumb character funny in a witty way, but they pulled it off. Like I said, an onslaught of jokes. They don't pause for a laugh track for soldiers buffoonery. They jam those moments in between other dialogue. That being said, some characters get less shine than others. I'm sure they would get more focus in later episodes had they been made. When you want more from a show, just more content with more characters present, it's common to want to extend an 11 minute show to a 22 minute show. And while I couldn't possibly know how that would work out, and I would love to see more characters in their own little B-plot adventures, I think it would be a detriment to the show. I say that about most 22 minute shows, 11 minutes is the prime for me. Who knows, maybe they could pull off 22 minutes of nonstop jokes, but it's a lot easier to jam a bunch of jokes back to back in 11 minutes than it is to fill 22. No, I am great with girls. I both got buckets of chicken. 
You want to do it? Eh, okay. But you! Extending it may give us more downtime, which to a show like this isn't necessarily a good thing. And it's got so much goddamn style. I know the actual settings don't look great. I joked about Clone Wars having barren landscapes earlier in this year, and it would be hypocritical not to mention that here. But the unique character designs make up for that. Also, we had the potential to have a show animated and source filmmaker on actual television. Maybe that's why I don't view these backgrounds and landscapes as bland, because there's a sort of nostalgia to all of them and the source filmmaker and animations I watched as a kid. I watched a lot of YouTube animation as a kid. I'm just now realizing. Nope. nope. I didn't know what that sound was because I had only heard it in YouTube poops and shorts like this. How was I to know it came from a video game that I had never played? And that was bunch of Adult Swim failed pilots, or sorry, Adult Swim's biggest missed opportunities. What a hack. Some were bad, some were classics still shown today, some were lukewarm concepts or hollow spinoffs, some caused fallings out, and some caused new beginnings. But hey, I got a gush about Film Cow for a long time, so works for me. I'm solid. I hope he sees this, man. Also, uh, here's my pitch. If Jason is seeing this right now, uh, I, I could do voices. Check this voice out. Arr, I'm an old man. Pretty good, right? P pff, give me a job. That was my demo reel. It's a shame some of these didn't get made, and by some of these, really, I just mean Team Fortress 2. But hey, it would have been Adult Swim's first adaptation of a previous existing franchise. Except that Eltingville was based on a comic, and so was Snake and Bacon. Oh, and also other Scott Pilgrim shorts they did leading up to the release of the movie. Ah, oh, I forgot to talk about Scott Pilgrim. Okay, so in 2010, Universal Pictures... I think... I think they're ready for me. I made a mistake a little while ago putting my faith in someone I probably shouldn't have, but... My punishment can't be that bad. I mean, I already lost my hair. What more could they do to me? But some things need to be undone. And I need to go back. Oh, but don't watch Soul Quest Overdrive. It's not good. Ah! <laughs>